you take the, the patient in Texas, right? Could we have prevented that? Could we have talked to that patient and said, what are you coming in for today? Issued them a treatment plan specifically for things that would have been appropriate for that patient. Maybe the provider, whoever was doing the IV, could have said, I was planning on giving her potassium. And my providers could have said, absolutely not. What are you thinking? This is MedSpa Mayhem, the podcast all about the chaotic world of medical aesthetics. From Botox to lasers to IV bars, learn how to tell real versus fake, legal versus illegal, and safe versus potentially deadly. Hear the crazy stories inside the MedSpa world and find out what questions to ask and how to spot the people cutting corners. I'm your host, Dr. Kate D. Together, we explore the wild west of medicine that is the aesthetics industry. What exactly is a good faith exam? If med spa law is confusing, nothing makes people more befuddled than trying to wrap your brain around what is a good faith exam and who can do one. Today, I'm speaking with Paulina Riedler, co-founder of Spa Connect, a company that specializes in good faith exams. To make this part of MedSpa Law make sense and help you understand how to spot a spa that's skipping this incredibly important part of any aesthetic treatment. Hi, this is Dr. Kate D, and welcome back to MedSpa Mayhem. Today, I'm having a conversation with Paulina Riedler about the good faith exam. Paulina is an RN, with a background in functional medicine and IV therapy, who now is CEO and co-founder of her own company called Spa Connect. Paulina, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you for having me, Dr. D. I'm incredibly excited to talk to your listeners today about the Good Faith Exam. Fantastic. So can you explain to everybody what does Spa Connect do and why, of course, this is relevant to this topic? Yes. Absolutely. So Spa Connect offers virtual good faith exams to medical spas all across the country. So what that means is that we are able to perform good faith exams for patients in a virtual setting. So just like you would see your doctor in a virtual visit, we do that with patients at medical spas prior to them being treated for whatever it is that they're coming in there for. So that brings up the real important question. What exactly Mm -hmm. is a good faith exam? Can you explain that? Yes. So a good faith exam is a review with a patient by a mid-level provider or a physician. So uh, mid-level providers are nurse practitioners or physician assistants. So in the exam, what the provider is doing is gathering information about the patient's medical history, what types of things might be contraindications to the particular treatment that they are wanting to come in for. We also make sure that we go over what their concerns are and come up with a new treatment plan for the patient. So this is outside of the scope of what uh, an RN can do, which is why it can only be done by a mid-level or a physician, because it is involving a diagnosis and a treatment. Right. And we did touch on this a couple of episodes ago when we talked about basic med spa law 101 with Brad Adado, who's an attorney, and he explained that the initial diagnosis and treatment plan has to be done by a physician or someone working under a physician like a nurse practitioner or a PA. So RNs can't do that. Okay. So if you're going to a new place, you have to have a good faith exam first in order to establish a doctor patient relationship with the new place. So what can you explain what RNs can do? What's the per- the RNs do legally under their license? Absolutely. Yeah. So I am actually an RN by trades. I, before working at Spot Connect, I was running my own mobile IV business. Prior to that, was doing functional medicine and IV therapy inpatient. What I can do as an RN is I can carry out orders that have been delegated to me by a mid level or a physician. So that means that in the setting of a med spa, if I have a treatment plan 
given to me by a mid-level or a physician for a particular patient, I can carry that order out so long as I'm are certified and trained and able to perform that particular procedure like Botox or fillers. What I can't do is decide that this patient is a candidate for treatment and come up with the treatment plan on my own because that would be outside of my scope. That goes for any medical procedure, whether it's an aesthetic treatment or IV therapy, which we can talk about later because that's a very popular uh, thing right now is this IV therapy and med spas and mobile IV therapy, but essentially an RN needs a, a mid-level or a physician to receive that order that they can then go ahead and carry out. Right. Spas that are using your company services either don't have a mid-level or a doctor on site, or they, they maybe they have somebody, but they, they're not available to do con- consultations, is, or is it most of them just there isn't somebody on site um, working there? Is that correct? Yeah. So it can depend on on the state. I'm sure like Brad talked about is every state is different, right? Yes. But essentially um, a client who is using us, they do have to have a medical director in place. So we will only work with clients who have medical directors. That medical director may be seeing patients, their own patients in clinic. They might be also running a surgery center out of their practice, which is very popular right now. A lot of plastic surgeons have their plastic surgery in their med spa suite. So they may not be available to do consultations, initial consultations for patients all the time. And it might just be less efficient for the practice in general, for the SD or the mid-level to be spending a majority of their time doing those initial consults. So that's what a practice looks for other alternatives like Spa Connect, because we're able to facilitate that. We're not replacing their medical director or their mid-level. We're just augmenting them. So that allows them to have that peace of mind that we are here. We can provide the initial consults for patients so that they don't have to be available for every single patient. Right. So it makes sense. So you're basically outsourcing that aspect of the care. Okay. Correct. And, um, the, and the medical director is still responsible for uh, ultimately for the, the patient, the care of that patient, right? Because we're not there physically. We're not actually putting hands on the patient. We're not treating the patient ourselves. So the, the medical director still has to be just as involved, but they're just not having to spend the, that actual time, right? Uh, consulting and doing the good faith exam with that patient but the responsibility still lies with that medical director. Right. So the liability is basically with the medical director. So you have a relationship with the medical director. I assume that your your contract is probably with the medical director and not with the RN and the clinic carrying things out. Correct. The, our contract is with medical directors. Like I said, we'll only work with clients who have a medical director. And so our agreement or states that the the client is operating up to the standards of their state's medical board and state regulatory requirements. And yes, we do have a, a pretty lengthy professional services agreement with each of our clients to outline what their responsibilities are, what our responsibilities are. So great. So just to clarify, anybody going to any of these clinics that work with Spa Connect, Spa Connect is actually ensuring, even before you have your, signed your contract with them, that they're operating legally. You have a legal compliance arm that just makes sure they are up and on the up and up. We do. Before we onboard any new clients, we look into how their business is structured from a a high level. Uh, And a lot of that comes out in the sales process because uh, our clients will ask questions about who needs to sign the agreement. So it starts us down the road of talking about how their business is structured. And once we, as we've expanded into new states, there's obviously the need for us to maintain a level of compliance above that which we had when we were only in two states when we first started. So there is a lot of time and resources that the company puts into our compliance arm. And for good reason, because you'd be surprised a lot of clients who come to us, they're just getting started, right? So they're also looking to us as a resource. What do I need to do? How do I need to set up my corporation? And we obviously are attorneys, so I always refer them to usually to Brad, but <laughs> he's our one of He's our a smart guy. So I... <laughs> he's the guy. He's the guy. So go talk to Brad. There's 
there's a lot of need for resources and support in this industry because as there's a lack of regulation still, we've come a long way, but we also have a long way to go. So yes, we, we have a huge uh, compliance aspect to the company that uh, we dedicate to understanding the laws in all the states that we're in and making sure that our clients are aware of that as well. So have you had people coming to you to maybe get the good faith exam who didn't even know they ha needed to have a medical director? Yes, yeah, so less and less now. In the beginning, 12 years ago, we had a lot of clients that would come to us because they were hearing about us through word of mouth. Most of the growth that we experienced in the first half of our company's lifespan was all from referrals and word of mouth. So as the medical board in California started to really come down on more uh, medical spas that were practicing illegally, the word started to get around, hey, you should be doing good faith exams and here's a company that can do that for you in a virtual setting. There is a lot of clients in the beginning who did come to us and say, what, what is this good faith exam? Why do I have to do it? I've been, I'm an RN, I've been doing Botox for 20 years and I've never done this and I feel like I, I, I'm frustrated that I have to do this now. I'm spending money to, to do this. There's been a change, but yes, I will say once in a while, we still do get people who are unsure if what they're doing requires a medical director. Mm -hmm. What we always say is that any, any medical procedure in any state requires a medical director and a medical corporation and therefore a good faith exam. Exactly. And this is true across states. So I know it can be really confusing because the laws are so different in all the different states, but it is 100% true that in every state, you, you have to have somebody who, practice, who can practice medicine independently do your diagnosis and treatment plan. And in most states, that's a doctor. And in some states, a nurse practitioner can do that independently. And as far as I know, in all states, a nurse practitioner or a PA can do it if, as long as they are working under a doctor. So you, I think you primarily have nurse practitioners doing your good faith exam. We Is that do. correct? Yes. And actually right now we are 100% nurse practitioners on our staff and we have our own team of supervising physicians. So our nurse practitioners are being overseen by our team of supervising physicians. And we have a pretty extensive compliance aspect to the supervision program that we have in place as well. So we have recurring meetings every month and we make sure that our providers are touching base with not only their supervising physicians, but their clinical operations manager and other professionals in the industry who come to our meetings and train our providers and make sure that they are keeping up to the standards uh, that we have. Okay, so the team, if you're going to get just what people think of as a simple Botox treatment, you're seeing first a nurse practitioner potentially in another state who's supervised by a doctor somewhere else, and then you're seeing an RN potentially or another injector locally who's being supervised by yet a different doctor, all for potentially a fairly you know quick appointment otherwise, right? Is, is a virtual consultation a uh, good faith exam legal in every state? There are some nuances with certain states, meaning that they haven't explicitly said it's legal nor is it illegal. And a lot of that is up to interpretation. And in our experience, all the states that we're in do allow for virtual good faith exams. But there are a few that we are working on getting in that have some ambiguity there in the in the law. So that's why we work with a, a team of attorneys to help us understand what we can and can't do. Right. I think uh, before COVID, it, it wasn't allowed nearly as much as it is now. And so much of medicine went onto virtual platforms very, you know, quickly. And that's I think exactly that, right. and those permissions have, have, for the most part, stayed as far as I know. It used to be all psychiatric and counseling was not virtual and now it's almost all virtual. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of other medicine has gone that way too. I think the key thing for that in the regular medical world is that there's actual reimbursement for that now. It, 
before COVID, there was very little reimbursement. So if you did a phone call or virtual appointment, you wouldn't get paid. So that's why right. if you needed a refill after a year, your doctor made you come in because the amount of work it takes to check everything and make sure you really need it and blah, 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 and then redo the refill, you won't get paid if you do that over the phone. <laughs> but, so now at least there are much simpler ways of doing that. So that's interesting. That's um, so have you had clients that you've turned away because they refuse to be compliant? Yeah, it hasn't happened a lot, but I will say that there have been a handful of clients that we have chosen to work with for various reasons. Our contract is explicit that um, either party can terminate the relationship at any time for whatever reason. Um, so I don't stick people into contracts. I don't believe in that. I think people should be able to part ways if it's not working out for either of them. And yes, we... I've had a few clients who we felt either were not operating appropriately or simply were not following the standards of care up to the, the standards that we feel like they should. The, the thing that is tricky, and as I'm sure some of your listeners may as well, is that medical boards uh, can come out with uh, opinions or, or just general regulations that can be a bit ambiguous. And so it allows for some people to interpret it in their own way and and some people feel that their standard of care is this different than what maybe other people would feel as is, is a standard appropriate standard of care so that leads room for some people to say well we feel like we can do it this way and that, that's okay and until they are either investigated by the medical board or something comes out of that they they continue operating in that fashion we do i would say we have we take a very conservative approach and so therefore, I think we weed out certain clients from the beginning who are either not willing to take the time to do this process with Spock and then get the good faith exams done or just don't want to spend the money on it. So I think where we've set ourselves up is that we, we really don't see a lot of our clients coming through the door anyway. But yes, there have been a few that we've turned away in the past. You mentioned earlier IV bars. So I was hoping to talk a little bit about those and, and how those function. I think in the past also you told me that there was one IV bar that you turned away. Yeah. So you can tell that story and just in general about IV bars. Yeah. So I have a lot of IV therapy background because I was doing outpatient IVs and then I transitioned into doing a mobile IV business. I found that there are there was a lot of, at the time, a lot of interest in that. It was the beginning of the, the boom of, of mobile IV therapy. I had a lot of experience seeing patients who were really sick and being able to watch them benefit from, from IV nutrient therapy. So I felt very passionate about it. My experience was that I couldn't operate, excuse me, I couldn't operate my business without using Spa Connect at the time because I'm just an RN. So I did need the, the treatment plan and, and good faith exam by a, a mid-level. I saw directly the benefit of, of being able to have a business, but uh, be able to utilize Spa Connect and doing that. And I think the IV kind of boom, uh, we saw that in, in the business. We've seen a real increase in the amount of clients who are primarily doing IV therapy. Again, it's like every stage is different, but of course, if you're going to be doing a procedure like an IV, you need a good faith exam. That's just it. There's just, there's no way around that, right? So IV can, can, can you be, explain, I mean, we're both nodding our heads, but can you explain, yeah. you know, why that is? Why is that so important? Yeah. So it's an invasive procedure. You're obviously entering into the patient's bloodstream. And so whatever one is being administered needs to be uh, appropriate for that patient. And you need to make sure that the person who's doing it uh, has the credentials and the experience and the training to be able to monitor that patient throughout that IV procedure. I think that that's a that's a hot topic right now because of what happened last year in Texas, uh, and, and I think that's something that pro professionally I feel very passionate about, and personally I feel very passionate about because that the patient who unfortunately passed away last year was a mother and I'm sure a friend to, to loved by many and. Uh, is a really unfortunate thing that happens. So I hope that more regulation will come to the, the IV therapy business as a whole. Yeah. And, and if, 
if uh, anyone out there is listening and hasn't heard that episode, the very first episode of Med Spa Mayhem that we did uh, was on this topic in that case, and that was called IV Bars Can Be Deadly. So if you're interested, go back and, and listen to episode one. And and yeah, in that case, monitoring is really important. So choosing the right patient. So we're used to treating disease with IVs. So if somebody's dehydrated, obviously, or if somebody is, say, pregnant and has hyperemesis, which means they throw up constantly and can't keep food down, they might need an IV. People who are cancer patients. So we're used to using IVs as a therapy for sick people. But IV bars have popped up all over as some kind of health booster. But the one that makes sense for me is, is in, in places where people are up late partying, like in Vegas or Key West, where you know they want to rehydrate and party again. That to me makes a little bit of sense, but you really have to be careful about who you choose to do that on. You have to make sure their kidney function's okay. You have to make sure they don't have any other diseases that might cause a complication if they're diabetic and whatever. And then, of course, you have to know what you're doing. I mean, the, the problem in the Texas case was this person did not know what they were doing, was not medically trained, and hung a level of potassium that just killed her instantly and just didn't know any better. And that's the most frightening part of it, really. But if there are people like that, I doubt they are reaching out to companies like yours because they're already basically illegal. Though this person was quasi-legal, she wasn't really being monitored by this doctor who was her medical director. And that's a whole other problem in the industry of doctors handing over their medical license for a nominal fee and people practicing medicine under them without any supervision. And that's rampant. Yeah. I, I kind of yeah. wonder, do, does your company do anything to make sure that that's not uh, the case with these, with the companies that you're doing business with? Yeah. So we, we take uh, a lot of time to make sure that their company is in fact, a medical organization. Uh, and <laughs> okay, well, that's a good. A that's a good start. That he did, right? <laughs> You'd be surprised, and and that they have a medical director who is involved uh, in the practice. So that medical director, we have to get in contact with in order to set up this client. That's the first step. Uh, we obviously ensure that this medical director is uh, licensed in the states that this client is operating in, and then uh, we look at what. Uh, treatments that they're offering and make sure that those align with for the treatments that our team can evaluate for. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in, in how these med spas, a lot of med spas are regulated in certain states. In California, we have, we have a lot of regulation. I think probably some of the strictest in the country, but there's a lot of states that it's still really like the wild west. And I experience that when I talk to clients in most states. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you will actually be surprised. The podcast that uh, will uh, be on, like it was about two weeks ago, was a young woman who did go to an unlicensed person in California. And actually, they were completely illegal, almost killed her. Uh, she's around to talk about it now. Uh, but, uh, even in California, <laughs> yeah, it seems yeah, like it the Wild West happen. sometimes. Yeah, it can still happen. You know, what I what I always preach is that, look, a good faith exam is necessary for any medical procedure. IVs are probably one of the more, now this is coming from someone who had a business doing IVs, but it can be one of the more dangerous things because whatever you're putting into a patient's bloodstream, as we know, could potentially kill them if you're not trained and you're not doing things appropriately, right? So that's why... Right. That's why there, there's, there's a need. There's a need for more regulation, and I hope it's coming. But when we look at like California, for example, yes, there is still, there is always going to be people that skirt around the law in some way, shape, or form. But my thought process is that we put things in place, guidelines in place. For example, a speeding limit. People are always going to go over the speeding limit, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have one. Right, we put guardrails in place, having good faith exams, and and making sure that everybody understands that this is an important thing to do. Are people always going to do it? No, but that doesn't mean it's any less important that that we shouldn't be pushing people to make sure they're doing this. 
you take the, the patient in Texas, right? I don't know. Could we have prevented that? There's a whole, we could speculate and talk about that for days, but I think if they had a resource like Spot Connect, could we have talked to that patient and said, what are you coming in for today? Issued them a treatment plan specifically for specific things that would have been appropriate for that patient. Maybe that the provider, whoever was doing the IV could have said, I was planning on giving her potassium. And my providers could have said, absolutely not. What are you thinking? So just right. to have the... Uh, just to have that resource, because not every medical director is going to run their clinic the way that that we might want. Knowing that people can have a resource like Spot Connect gives peace of mind to the providers. And I hear that all the time from our clients is I feel much more confident in, in running and operating my business and seeing patients because we have you as a resource. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. So I think that the Texas case has brought a lot of attention to Texas. And I do think that there are some politicians who want to change the law there. I do not think that the provider there, her name was Amber Johnson, and she had no license to do anything. She wasn't an RN. She wasn't medically trained whatsoever. That doctor should never have loaned his license to her to practice. So that law just needs to be changed, period. Like, I don't, that should not be legal no. anywhere. But given the law that it does exist. Uh, she required that she should have required a good faith exam and one was not done in mm -hmm. at all. So these IB, IV bars are popping up all over where there's a menu and it looks like a cocktail menu and I'll have the, the cosmopolitan version of an IV. So in, so we know that that is not legal to just order up an IV for yourself. So in, in one that's operating legally, let's say who's using Spa Connect as, as a service, what, what does that look like? You're the patient, you, you walk into the IV bar, what's supposed to happen there? What, what's the workflow like? So most of them, if they're a first and mortar place, most of them have a room that the patient will go into to have the private consultation with one of our providers. And they'll ask them questions about what they're, what they're coming in for, what their medical history is. And then we issue a treatment plan that's based around what exact uh, ingredients that the client can have or should have in their, in their IV bag that day. And so when the client or the patient is not determining that on their own, but we issue the, the treatment plan that includes those vitamin and nutrient ingredients. And then the RN who's carrying that out in the clinic can't deviate from that because that's what the order says. Correct. And, and usually they have uh, their own SOPs in the clinic that state how, how their process is handled from there after they have SPA Connect, whether what kind of uh, compounded ingredients that they're using to put into that IV bag. But Yes, the, the RN there who is doing the IV would then go ahead and administer the treatment plan that was issued by our provider. Yeah, so at least that would have provided a, a check and balance to make sure that someone didn't just make something up that could exactly kill somebody. Right. Yeah, exactly. And and look, I, I again, I I did this for a living for a long time, and I, I was very well trained. I went to conferences all over the country to understand... IV nutrient therapy and and I still recognize that it, it was outside of, it is outside of my scope for me to be able to come up with what this patient should be having today and and I think that that's just because it has become so mainstream the the IV hydration and the IV bars people don't recognize that the same as they they don't see it the same as they do me just deciding that this uh, Dr. D I think you should have a prescription for that's why that's outside of my scope, but it's the same thing with IV therapy. It's outside of my scope as an RN to be able to say, I think you should have these things today in your right. IV and without having. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people do not understand that getting an mm -hmm. IV is the practice of medicine and that really only doctors can practice medicine or mid-level working under a doctor. Mm -hmm. And you can't just order these things up like cocktails, although you can right mm -hmm. now, it's, it's, it's happening all over the place. And I, I'm just, this is a word of warning to people. It is not safe to do this. So don't. So if you are going to a place that does not do the good faith exam, they are operating mm -hmm. illegally and you should not proceed. You should just walk out the door. 
Um, is there anything that's different about having a virtual good faith exam that people should know? Questions to ask? or Because I don't think that every company that provides these um, virtual exams is the same as Spa Connect. Obviously, I do my homework. So I know about Spa Connect and I think you guys are doing a really great job and you're very thorough. And I think one of the most important things is you're making sure that the place that you're working with is functioning legally and properly and in a medically sound way. So is there anything that potential patients or consumers can ask to, to sort that out? What questions should they ask of the, about the good faith exam or of that good faith exam provider? Yeah, so I think asking about who they are, specifically what are their credentials, our providers always introduce themselves as their name and nurse practitioner. We also display their credentials at the bottom of the call so that while they're talking to the, the provider, they, they clearly see who they're talking to and, and don't misconstrue if they're talking to the medical director at that clinic or anybody else other than the stock nurse practitioner. Number two, I would say asking about they can ask about their experience in doing good faith exams or aesthetic procedures in general. I think when you're working with somebody who, let's take a patient perspective, right? I'm talking to somebody about getting Botox or getting filler. I want to make sure that this person understands those treatments completely and understands what those contraindications are and what some of the risks might be and be able to have a conversation that's neutral. And I think that's what I really love so much about the service that we offer is that we are a neutral third party. That means I'm not incentivized by whether this patient receives Botox or filler today or or doesn't, or I'm not trying to upsell them to anything. I don't make any money off of whether this patient gets treated today or not. And so that's the beautiful part of the service is that we are, we do work in conjunction with the client, but we are wholly separate in the sense that we are here to protect the patient and the healthcare provider. That's our mission statement, protecting patients and, and providers. So I think that's, that's the difference is potentially you could ask as a patient, how are you affiliated with this place that I'm in today? I'm at ABC Med Spa. And how are you affiliated with this place? We get that question a lot. So our providers explain that we are working in conjunction with this Med Spa, but I think the fact that we are a neutral third party puts trust uh, in our patients because they understand that we're not incentivized at all by what. Right. I mean, so they could ask that. They could say, so do you make money if I do lots of stuff today or yeah, not? I think it's a great, that's, I think that's a fair question. Absolutely. Yeah. And then are, are your NPs licensed in every state or how do you do that? Yeah, you, so you have a lot have, of NPs and you have enough of do. them licensed in all the states. We, that do. It, okay. we do. We have a team. We have about 20 nurse practitioners and they are licensed in various states. So we try to span. We're, we're going to be in 40 states by the end of this year. So we span different states based off of who has what licenses already and put them into groups so that we can cover all of the states that we operate in. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say this. I'm, I'm, I don't know who your competitors are or how many of them you have. I, I do know that I, I'm on some uh, public forums where, where people do aesthetics, and one of them is a very mi weird mishmash of different providers. And someone recently said, I use Spa Connect, and it's getting expensive. Does anyone have any cheap alternatives? Mm -hmm. And it made me cringe because I don't, I don't know who the cheap alternatives are, but I just know that the likelihood of the incentives to not be thorough the way your company is thorough, to make sure that the places are operating legally and safely costs money. And so they don't want to pay it. And I think it's interesting, though, because there is this level of, well, I want to be legal, but only on paper. I think that's the, I hear that a lot. It's, well, I want to dot I's and cross T's, but not, not actually practice that way. And that is something that the lawyers talk about all form and no substance. So the lawyers can help you put in all the contracts in place and the legal entities in place, and they can tell you what's supposed to happen in the flow of money and the way that's supposed to happen. People might have all of the paperwork done, but not actually carry any of that out. And I think that doing the good faith exam and making sure that 
that is, it's not just performative. It's not just jumping through a hoop that doesn't matter. Like that actual, that hoop is like a gatekeeper to make sure that you're safe. And so there's a reason the hoop is there because hopefully we're preventing, you know, deaths like uh, the one in Texas last summer. There are actually many more IV deaths that I've heard about over the last couple of weeks. And if I do manage to get details on those, I can, I'll I'll talk about those in in further. But I do think that for anybody who's interested in any of these services, and if they're going to a place that does not have a doctor or a mid-level provider present, and they they need to at least make sure they're getting a good faith exam done virtually through a company like yours. And the problem is that as new entrants come in, oh, there's money in that. Let me make some money doing good faith exams. I'm an NP. I could do this and undercut that. But they might not be licensed in your state or they might not have their own medical director or it could be or they could be helping non-legal people uh, look compliant on paper as with everything in this industry and I probably with every industry but this is the one we're in so we know all about it (laughs) there are so many people cutting those corners so is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners with yeah I think on that topic we've been doing this for 12 years and I've seen a lot of clients be investigated by the medical board and I've seen clients who probably needed to shape up their operation But also clients who were doing a really good job, who were investigated because they either had an angry competitor or an ex-employee who reported them. Mm -hmm. And they have to go through the process of being investigated by the medical board. And I will say, when the medical board comes knocking, who do you want by your side? Who do you want to be supporting you and have as a resource? Is it the person who, or the company that's been doing this for so long and been through the the rigor and can advise you on what is best or is it the people who are just trying to make a buck and i'll tell you i will go to bat for our clients in my lab and i continue Mm -hmm. to do so because i care a lot about the patients and the clients i mean I'm, i'm a nurse first so i'm all about patient advocacy but i care about the industry as a whole because we're all consumers we all deserve to be going to places who are in business to not harm us yeah first do no harm absolutely exactly yeah exactly so i would just say this is true for consumers and for potential clients of ours you get what you pay for yes that is very true in all of life but especially in aesthetics well paulina thank you so much for coming today and explaining this i know that a lot of times talking about legal stuff and good faith exam and it's a little arcane and 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 people Uh, We're like, really? But I think take home message for everybody is that it's a critically important part of patient care and it it can't be skipped. Absolutely. So thanks so much for joining me. I appreciate having you here today. Thanks, Dr. D. I hope this conversation has cleared up what good faith exams are and just who can perform a diagnosis and treatment plan. Remember, if you walk into a new spa and there is no good faith exam, that's illegal in every state. Tune in next week to hear a conversation with my favorite oculoplastic surgeon, Dr. Troy Woodman, who will be talking about what to look for if you're considering any kind of plastic surgery. If you've learned something and like what we're doing, please tell your friends and give us a five-star rating in your podcast app. If you have a question or a crazy story of your own you'd like to share, please send an email or voice recording to info at drkatedee.com. That's D-R-K-A-T-E-D-E-E. Dot com, or reach us through the website medspamayhem.com. And read the book. Medspa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Thanks for listening. This has been Medspa Mayhem with Dr. Kate D. We are so grateful you're listening, and we hope you've learned at least one fun or possibly disturbing fact today. Don't forget to hit subscribe on your podcast app and leave us a five-star review. And read the book. Medspa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Links and more can be found in the show notes and on medspamayhem.com. Medspa Mayhem.